All right. So exam is on on, on, on Thursday. Woo. Super fun. So uh, to refresh your memory, there'll be 25 multiple choice questions. And then there will be just some straight up conceptual questions where I will ask you questions about the concepts in the class and you will have to tell me what you know about that concept. Um, and then there will be a big calculation question, like a 10 point calculation question, 10 points out of 50. Um, and no surprises, uh, essentially, uh, what are the things we've calculated in here? Standard deviation, right? What else have we calculated? Oh, thanks. Yeah. That's okay. I like my nail polish too. It's two different nail polishes. Uh, yeah. And so there's a silver one and then there's a glittery one on top of it. Yeah. Because the lady said, if you don't put the if you don't put the, the silver one down first, we'll see the glittery one. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So 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 we've learned how to calculate standard deviation, but on our way to that, what else did we calculate? Mean, what else? Median. Median. <laughs> median mode. So knowing how to get a mean, median, and mode, super important, right? And then calculating the standard deviation, super important. But what do we calculate on our way to the standard deviation? Variance. The variance, right? So definitely need to know how to calculate all those things, right? Definitely. We also learned how to calculate the range. That's pretty straightforward. So those basic calculations will certainly appear on the exam, right? Right, so, so, so definitely know how to do that. Is that the exam? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in order to find the median, what should you probably do first? Put those numbers in order, because do you imagine I'm going to give them to you in order? No. No, that would be way too easy. And that's not how data comes to us, right? We don't get people neatly in order. Right? No. All right. And there, I deleted one of my answers. All right. So tell me the difference between a population and a sample. Oh, population is the entire thing. Yeah, it's everybody. So all statistics is in service of what? Well, what are we trying to do when we do statistics? Is it just math for its own sake? Right, we're trying to ask and answer research questions, right? Data analysis, statistics, statistics for the behavioral sciences is all about asking questions about people, research questions about people. So what is a population? Everyone that falls within the category of people you're looking for. Right, everyone who falls into the category of the people you're looking at. So not all the people in the world, not every statistic that we calculate is going to meant to make a decision about all 7 billion people on the planet. No, it's when you ask a research question, who are all the people you're trying to make a decision about, right? Who are you trying to make an estimate about? Who are you trying to make a decision about? That is the population. So then what's a sample? It would be used to make assumption. Yeah, the actual people that you are going to collect some data from. That's the sample. The actual people you get. And most of the time, it's not the population, right? It's a subset, a smaller group of people that allows you to make a decision about a larger group of people, right? And so when we calculate a number for a population, what do we call that? Like, let's say, let's say I calculate the average for everyone in this class, because I just want to know what the average for this class is. It would be the mean. It would be mu, because it's a what? Oh, mu is a population parameter, right? But let's say I, I get the average in here because I don't want to make a decision about people in here, but I just want to see at, you represent all of the honors classes I've ever taught. Now, that very same average, it's not mu anymore, what is it? It's x bar, and it's now called a what? It's a sample, not a parameter, but a statistic, right? Because statistics come in two varieties. They can, they're estimates because they're describing your sample as the best estimate of you have of the population parameter. Descriptive statistics, everything we've calculated so far has been descriptive, our best estimate of the population parameter. 
But also inferential. We haven't calculated any inferential statistics yet. Nothing where we're going to make decisions yet. All we're doing is estimating right now. Describing our samples as estimates of our populations. That's all we've done so far. Mean, median, and mode, descriptive statistics. Variance, standard deviation, descriptive statistics. Right? I would know the symbols that we use for all the various things we've calculated. So as we already mentioned, when we, when we calculate the average for a sample, it's called x-bar, right? We know what x-bar looks like? Yes. If we calculate the average for a population, it's called mu, right? And x-bar is always meant to estimate mu, right? right? Always. Whenever we calculate an average for a sample, it is intended to be an estimate of mu. We're never trying to make decisions about our samples. We use our samples, we use our statistics to make estimates and make decisions about populations. Yes? On the routine part with the large problem, do you want us to write the symbol or the actual say variance? Oh, uh, the calculation, a portion of the exam is intended to see if you can calculate. Okay, so, so however, as long as you're using the correct symbols, I don't care what you use. You want to write standard deviation, right? Because the math is different. Right? So it'll be clear to me that you understand. Let's, so let's say I, so on the calculation question, I'm not going to make it unclear. I'm going to either ask for a parameter or I'm going to ask for a statistic. And you will know which one to use. N versus N minus 1, right? Because that's the only difference. N versus N minus 1 in the standard deviation, right? right? And, but I'll, 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 or I'll sell, tell you, you are dealing with a sample here. Or I'll tell you, you are dealing with a population here. I'm never going to make you guess. If you think I'm making you guess, just come up and ask. I'm not clear whether or not you're dealing with a sample here. And I'll go, see this one here? I'll direct your attention to it. So know the symbols that we use. And so what symbol do we use for the standard deviation for a sample? S sub whatever the variable letter is. S sub x, S sub y, S sub z when we get to many variables later on. Right? What's the symbol we use for the variance of a sample? S squared, right? Because that's the mathematical relationship between the standard deviation and the variance. The variance is the standard deviation squared, and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, right? What symbol do we use for a population standard deviation? It's the lowercase Greek letter sigma, but you should know that it's the lowercase Greek letter sigma, but also recognize that symbol, right? It looks like a little circle with like a tail. It looks like a little cape. I would think of like soup for sigma, a little, little circle with like a cake. That's how I, how I think about it. I have lots of cute little devices I use to remember stuff. Wait, which one is that one? Sig lowercase Greek letter sigma is this population standard deviation. And S of X is always our best estimate of sigma, right? It's always our best estimate of sigma. And so what do we use for the population variance? Sigma squared. Sigma squared, right. Know that? Yes? Does sigma be a variable, like sub x? No, it doesn't. No. I mean, it could, it, it could theoretically, but that's, you certainly could, yeah. But mo most of the time, once we're dealing with inferential statistics, or we need to specify S of x, S of y, right? We, we are generally, generally speaking, uh, we're not using, we're making decisions at that point as opposed to making estimates. But yeah, you could reasonably have sigma sub x or sigma sub y, and you would know how to interpret that, right? Same as how you would s sub x or s sub y. Yes? Um, the n minus 1 was for finding the sample, right? If you are calculating the sample standard deviation or the sample variance in that equation, it calls for n minus 1, which is the total number of people that you have minus 1, right? But you don't use n minus 1 when calculating the average itself, right? Because the average is not a biased statistic. The average is just well, the average is not biased. There's no systematic bias when you're calculating the average. There, there's no, you're not, it's not going to be systematically too big or too small. It is the best estimate you have using the sample to estimate the population average. But, but, but let's just talk about this now, right? I strongly recommend you understand conceptually in a very detailed way why we use n minus 1 when calculating for samples. Because it, and this is something where I, I expect a deeper level of understanding on your part. 
because I appeared into your future and a deeper level of understanding is required on why we use n versus n minus 1, right? So, why, so first and foremost, using n would result in a number that is what? Small. Too small. It will be a, an underestimate if you use n and not n minus 1. So you definitely need to do that. You need to understand that idea. That's the first thing you should probably understand. If you use n instead of n minus 1, when you calculate the standard deviation for a sample, you will get something too small. And that's something you saw in your lab, right? When you switched, when I said, now what would it be for the population, you saw how that number got smaller if you assume it's for a population. And so we mathematically make it bigger on purpose. I would definitely understand that piece of it and be able to talk about that piece of it. You use, if you use n minus 1, you're, what you're doing mathematically is making it bigger on purpose. Because when you divide by a smaller number, the whole thing gets what? Larger. Bigger. Right? 4 minus 1 is a bigger, 4 over 1 is a bigger number than 4 over 2, right? So note that's the second point that I recommend you be able to discuss with some detail, theoretically speaking. Yes? Are there going to be any, like, yeah, there are, there, are, there are three essay questions. There are 25 multiple choice questions. There are three questions where you need to just respond to me about some idea. This would be an area, and we are currently discussing an area with which I think you should know in sufficient detail. Right? Because this is, this is sort of a deeper level of conceptual understanding about statistical theory. And this is sort of what separates you from the other class, is understanding this sort of more deeper level ideas. But there's a third thing, is why? Why is using n minus 1 going to correct for bias? Why is it biased? That's the last piece that I think you should, that I think it's good for you to know. That the reason why using n would result in a number that's too small is why. Remember why we talked about it? Maybe less variance in the sample than the actual population. Yeah, there is less variability whenever you have a subset of people. Why? Because all, let's say their population is all 7 billion people, right? That's a whole lot of variability. All 7 billion people are very variable from each other, right? Whenever you grab a smaller group of people, there's going to be less variability in there. And so if you're going to use this S sub X, if you're going to use the sample standard deviation to estimate the population, you've got to make it bigger on purpose. Because there will be more variability in a population than a sample. Always, every time. Make sure you understand those three points. The fact that it will be an underestimate if you use N. We use N minus 1 to make it bigger on purpose. But the last and most important piece is because a sample will always have less variability in the population. A smaller group of people, there'll be just less variability because there are fewer people. Does that make sense? I recommend knowing that idea. I will spend some time on that slide. And make sure you really truly understand. Because it becomes clear to me when you're regurgitating, right? you're just writing down with the words that were on the slide and whether or not you truly understand it. right? What else? All right, so not all variables are created equal, though, right? And we talked about those so three classification systems for how we can classify different types of data, different types of variables. So what are, what's the most important way, I would argue? Quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative versus qualitative. And we have synonyms for those things. What's a synonym for quantitative? Very cool. No. Quantitative. Probably not the best synonym, but it's all, sometimes you use what's called measured. Oh, but that's a different classification system. And so what's a synonym for qualitative? Categorical. Categorical. And that's actually a much more common synonym. You'll hear, usually it's usually, you hear quantitative, right? But then you hear categorical or qualitative. It's just what, what you find when you're reading the literature. All right, but this is another, and so what does quantitative mean? People are different in terms of amount. Would you? And so what does qualitative or categorical mean? People are different in terms of actual type, right? So some examples, so, but, no, but, be able, but be able to recognize examples of this. So what would be an example of quantitative data? Reactions. Reaction times. Sure. What else? How many people there are. So, yeah, like the, like the number of people at a school, right? Some schools have more people than other schools, right? So now you're not dealing with people. You're de you're, the schools are your people, right? 
And different schools have more or less people, right? So just keep that in mind, right? What else? Did it turn off? Yes. Oh, no. So that's 15-12 on it. It's counting. <laughs> okay, so what, what else? What are some psychological variables that are, are quantitative? Yes. Yeah, how, de how depressed you are. Not whether or not you're depressed, because that would be categorical, right? Yes, depressed, no depressed. But how depressed are you? Are you just a little bit depressed? Eat some chocolate, feel better? Or are you very depressed, so depressed, you're clinically depressed, and there should probably be an intervention, right? That would be a quantitative psychological variable. What else? Because I imagine on the exam, I give lots of interpretation questions. I provide you a scenario and I ask you what's going on. So practicing knowing many examples of quantitative variables might help you at some, on, on the exam, right? Height. Height. Sure, definitely. More versus less height. How much you love your dog? How many kids do you have? How many video games do you own? What is what is your shoe size? All quantitative. So what are some examples of categorical variables? Are you depressed? Are you depressed or not? Yes. Any yes or no question. Anyone? Any yes or no question is, is categorical. Absolutely. Any true or false, yes or no, yes. Yeah, so let's use biological sex. Because this is not a sociology class, and I don't want to talk about what gender means right now, right? But biological sex certainly is categorical. There's male, female, and, and then there are some uh, non-insignificant number of people who are intersex. So it's certainly categorical. What else? What kind of car you drive? Categorical. What is your favorite color? Categorical. Right? So the other distinction that I made was between continuous and discrete. And this is a different question we can ask about the data, right? A completely different question. And so what does discrete mean? Like to the point, kind of? There's a finite, uh, sorry, finite, finite, I believe is. There's a finite number of options, but this doesn't mean, and so that means how you've measured it. What is this variable? There's only a limited number of choices, right? And that can certainly be quantitative still, right? Discrete, right? The number of books in a library is certainly quantitative, but you can't have like half books. It's discrete. One jumps to two, jumps to three. You can't have two and a half books, right? Or two and three quarters book in a library. It's discrete. But also, all categorical variables are discrete, right? All qualitative variables are discrete. Because the other option is continuous. Continuous, which means theoretically an infinite number of possible choices in between two endpoints usually, right? Like maybe you're measuring human height from you know, the smallest preemie baby that's ever been born you know, seven or eight inches, right? All the way up to the tallest human being, right? There's some endpoints on there. But in between those two endpoints, there's an infinitely fine number of measurements we could make on height. So it's completely continuous. The, the different choices in between the endpoints continually run into each other. Does that make sense? So I imagine uh, in your future, you might be looking at a variable. I describe for you how somebody's measured something. And maybe I give you some choices, right? And maybe one of your choices is, uh, categor is categorical and continuous. Is that even possible? No, right? So you're going to be trying to figure out, OK, first let's ask you the question. Is this categorical or measured? Is this qualitative or, 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 or quantitative? First ask that and go, yep, I'm definitely dealing with quantitative data here. Well, now I have to decide if it's continuous or discrete. 
Make sense? And just ask yourself, can I, could, I, could I measure this more finely? If you could, if you could go, well, technically, there's a place in between these two scale points, then it's continuous variable. Yes? Yeah, I would say qualitative is always going to be discrete. If you're dealing with quantitative data, now you can ask the question, is it discrete or continuous? I think that's a, great, that, that's a good way of thinking about it. All right, but there's a, yes? So semi-continuous is a fudge factor we use in behavioral science. Or what we're theoretically dealing with is continuous, but we measure it in so big, big chunks that it, we're, what we're measuring is really discrete. Like, tell me how much you love your dog on one to seven. Well, I've only given you seven choices, right? But if I choose three and you choose three, my three is probably not exactly the same as your three, right? So we, set, we call it semi-continuous. And in terms of like statistical theory land, it's a fudge factor. We're fudging. Because of the tough nature of psychological measurement. There will be many scenarios, not many, but there are some scenarios where you have to determine what is going on here. And usually, it's a combination of things. So what's the last way we can classify data? Stevens, 1946, and the one that your book spends the most time talking about. Nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And just like you could sort of say, all categorical variables or qualitative variables are discrete. All nominal variables are categorical or qualitative. All nominal variables are discrete. Nominal is just another way of saying categorical or uh, qualitative. But then he makes three other distinctions, right? And really, these are distinctions about how quantitative is your quantitative variable, right? That's what Stevens did, and he took them in order. To what extent is your quantitative variable quantitative? And that's where you get into the distinctions between ordinal, interval, and ratio. Ordinal, interval, and ratio. And you definitely are probably going to probably have to recognize on the exam whether or not variables are nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Yeah? So what does it mean to be ordinal? Yeah, they're placed in order by amount, right? So clearly quantitative. But the distinctions you're making are not fine distinctions. Specificity is not important. Just put people in order from best to worst, least to, least to greatest, smallest to tallest, right? Put people in order in terms of uh, amount. Just like you will do if you calculate the median, right? Just put people in order. And then give them a number that represents you're the first person, you're the second person, you're the third person, you're the fourth, you're the fifth. Right? Grades in a class are ordinal. A, B, C, D, and F. Doesn't matter if you get a 90 or a 99, you get an A. That grading system is an ordinal one. A, B, C, D, and F. But you'd never argue that it's not quantitative, right? An A is definitely better than an F. And that's the philosophy I take. <laughs> Well, I believe ordinal data is quantitative. I will argue it forever and ever that ordinal data is quantitative. Not everyone agrees with me, but that's okay. So the next level is interval, right? And it's much more specific. It worries about amount. It worries about amounts. And so the interval between two scale points is assumed to be the same. And, and psychologists certainly try real hard to de design our, our scales and our measurements, our tests, as interval. When I give you how much do you love your dog, one to seven, I'm, I'm hoping that as people are going choosing one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, that the difference between two and three and the difference between six and seven is the same. I am certainly hoping that. In practical application, that's a much dicier topic. But that's my hope. But things that are interval are things like temperature, right? The difference between the difference between 76 and 77 degrees is the same amount of change as as we move from 99 to 100 degrees. Moving one degree, each degree is a set is assumed to be the same amount of temperature. 
or dates, right? 1999, as we move to 2000, is assumed to be the same change in year as 2000 to 2001, from 1950 to 1951. The same amount of time has passed. And the last one is ratio. And real, what's the difference between interval and ratio? Yes. Right, a true meaningful zero point. And what does that mean, though? Because that's a good thing that you memorized from the slide. But what does that mean when we say a zero point ratio? When we're measuring something on a ratio scale, zero is truly meaningful. What does that mean? There can actually be zero of the thing you're measuring. That means zero means none of it. Right? So if I ask you to tell me how much you love your dog from negative three to positive three, does zero mean no love? No, it's just an arbitrary zero point that I set on the scale. So at best, that variable would be interval. At best, could not be ratio. Or intelligence, could you theoretically have zero cognitive functioning at all? No, so intelligence, at best, is only interval. Most psychological variables like depression, love, intelligence, aggression, most of them are going to be at best interval because zero is usually just an arbitrary point on the scale. It's the same thing with dates, right? The year zero, does that mean no years? No, it's just an arbitrary place on the calendar that we've set at zero. <coughs> same thing with temperature. Does zero mean the absence of weather? No, there's only one scale of measurement in temperature where zero actually is ratio. Does anyone know what it is? I'm at, there's, how, what is, what do we measure in, in America, well, in the civilized, in, in the world, there's two ways we measure temperature, like everyday understandings of temperature. What are they? Celsius, 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 and Fahrenheit. And they both have a different place on them that equals zero, right? right, right. So zero is clearly not a meaningful place. That means none of whatever it is you're measuring, right? Does anyone know another way of measuring temperature where zero actually does mean none of something? Kelvin. It's Kelvin. Actually means the lack of molecular movement, right? That's what Kelvin means. And so zero on the Kelvin scale is in fact meaningful. And so Kelvin is ratio. Yes. I have a question. Um, it's in regards to yesterday's uh, lab assignment. Sure. Um, so the reaction time of various rats responses to the stimulus of the electric shock. What would that be? It's ratio all day. But be what's the zero point there? Well, zero would mean it took no time at all. Whether or not a rat could actually respond with zero seconds, zero seconds would be no time. Does that make sense? It's about the scale of measurement, not whether or not a rat could theoretically respond with, you couldn't even theoretically have no cognitive functioning. And if you got zero in some like BuzzFeed test of intellect, zero would not mean you don't have positive function, cognitive functioning. It would mean you just got zero on this, on this lame test, right? But zero seconds would mean no seconds or zero inches would mean no inches. So despite the fact that there's never been a person born that had zero inches, the ratio, it's still ratio measurement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, reaction times are absolutely ratio. And then why do we call it ratio? Why, when we get a zero point, do we now call it a ratio scale? What is a ratio? Mathematically. So you're comparing two numbers, right? Three to two. 3 over 2, 5 to 7, 5 over 7, right? And when you have a true zero point, you can actually talk in terms of ratios. So if I got, so let's say the number of items you get correct on an exam is ratio, right? It is. Now, if I start saying your amount, if I use the number of exact items you get on an exam to represent how much knowledge you have, well, then we're not really ratio anymore, are we? Right? But if we're talking about the number of items correct on an exam, zero means you got none of them right. Does that make sense? And so if I got 20 items correct and you got 10 items correct, I got twice as many items correct than you, didn't I? I got twice as many items correct. Ratio. But if I have 80 degrees outside versus 40 degrees outside, do I have twice as much weather? No, because if you switch that, if you if you switch 80 degrees to 40, 40 degrees in Fahrenheit and switch to now Celsius measurement, is the ratio going to be preserved two to one? No. Nope. That's why it's that's and that and mathematically having a true meaningful zero point that means none of what you're measuring allows us to talk about ratios in that way. You with me? Good. 
All right. And so we spent a little bit of time talking about, yes, I'll show for just one. We spent a little bit of time talking about research methodology. So some of the basics of research methodology might show up on your test, like the types of sampling. So what is random sampling and how, or random selection, and how is it different from random assignment? What is sampling? And how do you make sure you have a good sample? You go to a random place and make sure you get people from different, uh, like, uh, that's what I'm looking for. Well, you're talking about a stratified random sampling, but we actually haven't, didn't cover that in here at all. Make sure, you have, make sure you have people from all the groups. But actually, truly random sampling just puts everybody in a bucket, mixes them all up, and then starts grabbing people randomly out of the bucket. That's random sampling, right? And the best samples are random, right? Best samples are random, despite the fact that we only do this in psychology like 30% of the time or less, right? So random samples, right? So that's part of what makes a, a sample good, a random selection procedure. Select your sample in a random way. And bigger is better, right? Bigger samples, all else being equal, is better, right? But we actually have to sample from who? The target population, the target population right? So if, I, if, I, if I'm interested in, for example, let's say I'm interested in the average exam grade at Pierce, right? And I get the exam grades of 100 honor students. Have I randomly selected from the population I care about? But I got, I got, I got 100 random honor students. Well, who cares? You didn't actually randomly sample from the population you cared about. And that is the most important thing if you want a good sample. You actually have to sample from the population you care about. And, that, and, and if, you, if you sample from a particular population, that is the population you can make a decision about. Bigger is only better. Random is only useful if you actually sample from the population you care about. So 50, 50, 50 randomly selected students would be better than 1,000 randomly selected honor students if I'm trying to make a decision about students in general. Does that make sense? All right, so random selection is how we, how we get our people, right? The random assignment is where I talked about the difference between experiments and observational data, right? Random assignment is if we're doing a true experiment, which is allows us to make statements about cause and effect, it's how we actually divide up our sample into different groups, right? And it's only relevant if we're doing true experiments. We spent a little bit of time on that research methodology section. <clears throat> so then we talked about uh, measurement theory. We talked about both reliability and validity. So there's definitely some conceptual questions on the, ta on the test that cover those ideas about reliability and validity. So what is reliability? What does it mean to say that a test is reliable? Yes. It's consistent. It's consistent, which means it's consistently telling you the same story. And there's two big ways that a test can be consistent. One is consistent over time, right? Now, some variables you wouldn't expect to be consistent over time, like mood. We would never call a test of mood unreliable because somebody was in a good mood at the beginning of the day and a bad mood at the end of the day. That's the nature of mood, right? Statistics is not a substitute for thinking and knowing about your variables, right? But that's one of the ways that a, a test can be consistent, is if you take the test once, you take it again, you get the same kind of result. Right? Another way that a test can be reliable is within itself, right? If you have like a 50, like anyone, if anyone here take an IQ test, there's like, like, there's like dozens of items on an IQ test. Each item is supposed to measure the exact same thing, right? It's supposed to measure the same thing about you, and if it's at least measuring something real about you, all of those items should tell you the same story. And there's different ways of estimating reliability, right? I would know those various ways of estimating reliability. Test, retest reliability. What kind of reliability is that assessing? But I imagine there's probably going to be application questions where I tell you, a researcher does this. What is she trying to establish? So if a researcher gives a test to, some, to the same group of people over and over and over again, what is this researcher hoping to establish? Yeah. Test, retest, reliability, right? So be able to recognize those kind of scenarios. But the, and, 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 and so there's also, though, 
We, have, we talked about split half and internal consistency, right? And that's checking to make sure that all of the items tell the same story. And so if I give the same test only once, but then check to make sure that all the people, if they are asking all the items in a similar way, then I, what am I probably assessing? Internal consistency. Or test, retest, uh, not, or uh, split half. So know those ways of estimating reliability, right? And be able to recognize what is probably being assessed if I gave you a scenario. <clears throat> we also talked a little bit uh, about, so we what are constructs? What is this, why do we have to bother worry, being worried about reliability and validity when we deal with behavioral science? Why do we even bother? Can't we just go buy a ruler at Home Depot for love? Yes? Because it's psychology so much that the data that you get, it's not numerical, and like you have to be able to analyze it properly. Well, it's not physical. Well, it's not that it's not numerical, it's just not a physical measurement, right? So you have to make sure that you're measuring the right thing, like what you're intending Yeah, and the reason why we call it a psychological construct is we have to construct our definition of it, right? And the way when we construct our definitions, what do we call those definitions? Constructs. They call them constructs, but they're called operational definitions, right? We measure constructs indirectly using good operational definitions, where we absolutely apply numbers to things. But they're always going to be imperfect. They're always going to lack some precision. And so then reliability.